Good evening, everybody. Um, the title of tonight's talk is I Spy With My Little Eye. I think we all played the game when we were kids. The eye is a very deceptive thing. They say seeing is believing, but uh, the eye is easily deceived. Not even nowadays when we have things called deep fakes where digital technology allows you to fool the eye. The eye by definition is an extension of the brain, one of the closest organs to the brain, connected directly to the brain. <coughs> and the eye really just performs the service of transmitting information to the brain, but how the brain construes that, interprets that, is very much subjective. I want to talk about the, the sin of the spies. As we know in this week's Pasha, the spies came back from spying out there at Israel, and they spoke negatively. It says they spoke Losh and Hara about the, the land of Israel. Now, a couple of questions come first to mind. If you look through the Sefer Chovetz Chaim, <coughs> which is really a modern-day compendium of the laws, the prohibitions of Losh and Hara, Lashon Lash Hara literally means evil speech. Lashon Hara, if you look through the Chobit time, you won't find any, to the best of my knowledge, Isu to speak evil about stones and wood and soil. How do you speak Lashon Hara about a land? Where do you, where do you see there's an Isu to do that? Now, of course, it's possible to speak Lashon Hara about wood and Let's say if you're somebody who's a furniture manufacturer and you say he uses inferior wood, so you're speaking Losh and Hara about the person. But how do you speak Losh and Hara about a land? Another question I'd like to deal with is why does the Torah categorize the sin of the spies as Losh and Hara? Isn't it more correctly um, understood to be Motsi Shemra? Moti Shemra, well, let's maybe we'll give a little bit of background here. The Rambam identifies three kinds of uh, what we would call under the general category of Loshan Hara. Rechilus, Loshan Hara, and Moti Shemra. Rechilus is of the three the least severe. <coughs> Rechilus means somebody who carries like a, a rochel. A rochel is a traveling salesman. And uh, somebody who speaks rechilus is, is a gossiper. The gossip could be um, not negative and um, it's not sent with, said with evil intent. Nevertheless, it's a nissa. Gossip. Gossip mongering. The second level is Loshan Hara. Loshan Hara is where somebody speaks to the detriment, to the uh, negatively about somebody, says something that they did, which, was, which would be understood negatively in other people's eyes. It's an Issa, or may cause them in some way some damage. And uh, it's true. And one of the things that always surprises people when they learn the laws of Lashon for the first time is that, yes, it's true, but that doesn't mean you can speak it. There are very, very strict parameters as to when and where you can speak Lashon Hara and how you speak it. Clearly, if somebody comes to you and says he's about to open a business with a guy that you know has just, been, just spent 10 years in Sing Sing, Sing, Sing or uh, you know, a well-known confidence trickster, you have to alert him to the fact but exactly how you alert him, how much you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to say, what is the subject of, of close halachic parameters. But the point is that it, it's true. It's true. It is true. But not everything that's true can be said. Especially if it's said, as Lashon Har is, with the intention to damage. It's really the difference between Rechilus and Lashon Har. The worst level of Lashon Har is where, which is called Motsi Shem Ra, is where the intention is to damage and the information is false. 
think they once said that, I forget, was some newspaper baron once wrote uh, on the masthead of his newspaper, all the news that's fit to print. I think you find a very little news which is fit, fit to print, actually. Most news which is fit to print would be something like uh, Mr. Cohen got up this morning and he had a very nice breakfast and he said good morning to his wife and uh, he got, went to the, the office and he gave out, uh, wrote a check for $50,000 to Docker. Not the sort of thing that people are particularly interested in reading in newspapers. Re unfortunately, newspapers, by and large, make... Um, I have to be careful what I say. I don't want to speak Lush and Hara. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> There was a, uh, the masthead of one newspaper, I said, said all the, all the news that's fit to print. Somebody once made a crack about it and just wrote all the news, that's, all the news that fits. <laughs> so my question is, number one, how do you speak Lush and Horror about a country, a land? Number two, how do you, why is it categorized as Lush and Horror? Clearly what the spy said was, was false was Motsi Shemra. Why do we speak of it as Lash and Hara? <clears throat> and also, there's something that needs to be understood. There's a Mishnah in Arachin, Erechin, says, um, The Lashon Hara is worse, or connected, the three cardinal sins <coughs> of Shvichas Domim, murder, Gilui Arias, sexual immorality, and the Vodah Zorah, idol worship. How do we understand that speaking bad speaking badly, speaking negatively, given that it could lead to very negative things happening to somebody, but how are they shakul, how are they understood to be equal? <coughs> so that's the, the questions I like to start with. Ah, yes, I found the Makor for that. It's a Gemara in, in Erechin, and it says, Tana Rabbi Shmuel, Kala Masape Loshon Hara, Magdil Avoinois, Keneged Shlosh Averos Avodos Kechavim, Gilui Arayas Veshvichos Domim. And brings Pesukim to support that. That's Erechin Daf Tes Vav Lamed Beis. How do we understand that telling a story which, true, Reflects, ne reflects negatively on someone, how can that parallel such terrible, serious crimes? Lashon Hora, Shafichas Domim, Gilui Arayas. The Torah says that man was created but Selim Elokim, in the image of God. Elokim. Davke Elokim. And Rav Chaim Velozhin says in the Nefesh Chaim that man's comparison, Betzelem Elokim, to God is that man, like Hashem, to, has, to a certain degree, has a power to create. Hakol Nhiye Bidvaro, he said all the time. Shehakol niye bivaro, that Hashem brought everything into existence. Shehakol <coughs> exists through His word. Hashem creates through speech. Of course, speech and connected to, connected to Hashem is something we don't really understand, but what comes down into this world as speech is on the highest levels some attribute which is the power of creation. Speech, is, speech creates. It says time after time in the, in the Maisa Bereshis, in, in the book of Bereshis, Vayome Elokim, Vayome Elokim, Vayome Elokim, 
over and over again. Hashem spoke. He said, Shehakol Niyebivoro. The word in Hebrew for a thing is one of the words anyway is Dava. Dava. Dava means a thing. Dava is also a word. The connection now is clear that really things are no more than Hashem speaking. Hashem spoke things into creation. And the Nefesh Chaim also says that the Kodesh Baruch Hu is Mechadesh B'chol Yom Tomid Maaseh Voracious, that Hashem is continually recreating the world every split, split second. So the Devar Hashem is there all the time. Hashem is constantly speaking every speak, split, split second, excuse me, into cre- uh, creation. The difference in this case is, is that when we talk about man being a creator, B'Tselem Elohim, this power of creation, is also in the, given to the power in the mouth of man. As it says, Devarai Asher Samti Beficho. Devarai, my words, Asher Samti Beficho, which I have placed in your mouth. Just as Hashem creates, the difference is that Hashem can create ex nihilo. Yesh <coughs> mi'ayin. Man doesn't have that ability, but man can create yesh mi'yesh. Man has the ability, through his power of speech, to build, to complete, and in point of fact, that's man's job. Man's job, which has been given over, the varai, my words, asher samti b'ficho, that I've placed in your mouth, the responsibility, the job, the <coughs> privilege of man, Mankind is that through the power of speech we can bring this world to its perfection. And Khalila, of course. Hashem creates everything positive and negative, equal and opposite. And therefore the power of speech, and this is really maybe the answer to one of our questions, but that's why it corresponds to those three terrible sins, is the power of speech is the power in a sense of death. Inappropriate speech creates a khurban, destruction in the universe, where the potential for perfection and shalom existed. The mouth has the power, has for khalila, to destroy, to kill on a cosmic level, <coughs> to destroy. <coughs> the Ramban. Explained that everything was created by Hashem, ex nihilo, voracious. There was a beginning. Hashem took nothing and he brought forth from nothing something, ex nihilo. Yesh mi ayin. The Ramban explains that this process started off first with Hashem bringing in something to existence, something that the Ramban calls hiuli. Hiuli, hiuli is a, a kind of unformed matter. <clears throat> matter without form. Raw material, so to speak, without a definite surah, a definite shape. And from this, on the seeding, succeeding days of creation, as we said through Hashem's Vayomer, that chomer, that raw material, can assume specific surot, specific shapes. Mm-hmm. And that's the power, as we said, to varesha samti b'ficha. Man was created to define, to determine, to fashion the tsura, the shape, the final shape of the world. And therefore, as we said, man's dibur, this power of speech has the power to create worlds, to give the world its shape, its tsura. And just... In the same way as when Hashem did, when Hashem said, Yehi or, that there be light, Yehi, man, has the ability to shape the form of reality. On a more precise level, Hashem created the world and said of it, Kitov, it's good, Kitov. When Hashem had finished creation, as it says, say for Bereshus in Perik, 
Aleph Lamed Aleph, Vayar Elokim es kol asher osa, vehine tov ma'od. Tov ma'od, very good. Tov ma'od, if you take the, let, the word ma'od, it has three letters, which are mem, aleph, and dalad, and you can re-age, rearrange that into the word adam. The tov ma'od of the world is the fact that there is an adam in the world who can bring the world to tov ma'od. That is man. Man's ability, man's job, man's responsibility. To take the tov and to make it into tov ma'od. Getting back to Lashon Hara, where do we learn the Issa of Lashon Hara from? It's interesting because it's from Miriam. Sefer B'midba, Perik Yubbeis, Aleph, V'tabea Miriam V'aron, B'moshe, Al Odes HaIsha, HaKusis. Miriam spoke Loshon Hora about Moshe. And that is how we learn about the Issa of Loshon Hora. Now, if you think about it, that's a very interesting Makor. Because clearly there was no malice of forethought in Miriam's speaking about Moshe. Miriam certainly was not in any way trying to denigrate or to... Uh, she made a mistake. And also, clearly, the Moshe was in no way affected by what Miriam said. Moshe, the, the following Posik says that uh, Moshe was the, hum, the most humble of all men. So, for sure, Moshe wasn't hurt by what Miriam said. And in a sense, her words in that way had no effect. She simply made a mistake and didn't realize Moshe's high level, his unique status. Nevertheless, the Torah presents Miriam's Losh and Hora as, as the worst kind and requiring us to remember what happened to her, that she got saras, she was sent out of the camp. So, though her words harm nobody in any way, Miriam abused the power of Dibur, and in that, as we said before, that lies the severity of Losh and Hora. It's not just that you can cause unpleasant results for another human being. Of course, that's, it's, that's very important. <coughs> it's usurping, distorting the essential power of man, the power of creation, and using it in a way which is destructive. Because man, as we said, has the power to create, and has for Khalil the reverse, through the mouth. And we're charged to remember. That's one of, if you look at the end of Shacharis in your Siddur, that's one of the six remembrances that we should try and remember every day, what Miriam did. So you see the severity of that. Something else to consider. There are only two limbs in the body which are described as either tov or ra, good or evil. Tov is something which reaches its tachlis, and ra, evil, is something which is cut off. It's from ra'ua, weak, unstable, broken. Ra pre prevents the perfection of something from coming to its proper tachlis. As I said, there are two limbs of man's body that are described as tov or ra, the ayin, ayin tov, ayin hara, and lashon, the tongue. Loshan Hara and Loshan Tov, Dibur Tov. When a person views something with an eye in Tova, the, there's a bracha that comes from it. Things reach their potential. Why is it that this, these two limbs, so to speak, these two Evarim, these two senses, are the only two that the Torah? ascribes these adjectives of good or evil to. The Khurban of the Beis Amikdash was created by the the Dibur Ra, 
of the spies. The sin of the spies, that elemental sin which led the five things we fast about on Tisha B'Av, all come from Dibur Ra. And as the Chofiz Chaim says, what destroyed the second base Amigdash was essentially Sinas Chinam, which he characterizes as Loshan Hara. The destruction, the power of the mouth is the power to connect, to Lechaber. We talk about a Chaver, a friend. Chaver and Churban are exactly the same letters. They're the opposite of one another. There's Chibur and there's Churban. The mouth can do one or it can do the either. If it doesn't connect, it destroys. In the book of Eicha, the book that we read, the book of Lamentations, the book that we read every Tish above, it's a shame this year we won't be reading it. The Gemara says <coughs> in Sanhedrin Daf Kuftalad on the base. Why is it that Eicha is built on an acrostic of the Aleph base? If you look at the way Eicha is constructed, the first posik, the first verse starts with Aleph, the second. By the way, if I'm not, if something's not clear, please stop me. Aleph, base, Gimel. Through the alphabet, mm-hmm. every verse has a different, pos- a different, um, different letter of the alphabet. Now, only the first chapter, the letters which begin the verses, follow the aleph base, with a single exception, that the pair precedes the ayin. The normal sequence of the aleph base is samach, ayin. In the subsequent chapters in Eicha, it goes Samach, Pe, Ayin. Why is it out of order? So the Gemara answers this question. Sanhedrin, Daf Kuvdala, Rama Beis, Oma, Rava, Oma, Rabbi Yochanan, Bishvil Ma, Hiktim, Pe, La, Ayin. Why is the Pe, the letter Pe, why does it come before the ayin? It's out of order, it should be the other way around. It says the Gemara, Bishvil Maraglim, because of the Maraglim, Sha'omru Bafihem, Mashalo Ro'u Be'inehem. That they spoke with their mouths that, that they did not see with their eyes. They were Maktim Per La Ayin. I spy with my little eye. What does it mean they were maktim per la'ayin? They, they put their mouth before their eyes. The correct way of creation is that we are supposed to see what is really there and to express that, the pair is at the service of the ayin. The ayin sees, and the pair expresses that. That's man's job. There is only one existence who can be maktim pair la ayin, and that's a Kodesh Baruch Hu. If you look again, going back to Briashis, time after time Hashem says, Vayoma Elohim, Hashem spoke, and he saw it was good. Hashem speaks and he sees. Only Hashem, so to speak, is able to write the script and then see it. Man's job is to see things as they are and express what exists. So to speak, the Meraglim, they, they went into Eretz Israel, and they, they filmed, so to speak, an imaginary script that was in their heads. They, they saw, they spoke out what, and they, they saw what they spoke, and that's now the answer to why it is that it wasn't 
um, uh, Motsi Shemra. They actually saw that. Motsi Shemra is to say something which is false. In their mind, this was the truth. They were magtim pe'ala ayin. They created a script, they spoke, and then they saw what they spoke. It's interesting that the two months that the spies spent stretch between Tammuz and, and Av. Each of the 12 tribes are connected one of, with one of the months of the year. According to some way of calculating, some ways of calculating, calculating this, Tammuz is the month of Ruvain, and Av is the month of Shimon. Now, if you think about it, Ruvain, the root of the name Ruvain is Reia, is to see. And the root of the name Shimon is Shmia, to hear. Clearly, Dibur only has any relevance in the presence of hearing. Where hearing is possible, Dibur makes sense. So we have these two months, really the month of sight and the month of speech, which is the same as the month of hearing. And that is the correct order of the year. Re'ia, you see. Shimon, you hear, meaning what? You speak. And those are the two months that the spies were there in Eretz Israel. Ruvain is, is Tammuz, and um, Av is Shimon. Ria and Shmia. So they inverted the month? So, so they inverted the correct order of creation. They spoke, and then they saw. They, they created their own, I, I think of it as like a film script. They wrote this script in their head for whatever reasons, and of course, many of the Forshim describe why it was they did this, that they were coming from a world of, a life of uh, living anani covered, the mon, a supernatural existence, uh, into a world which was going to be a, a, lev- a, a world, in Eretz Israel, of a much more down-to-earth, so to speak, kind of existence. And maybe that made it very difficult for them to see things as they really were. But they, yes? Yeah, they spoke to each other, or, didn't or you mean yeah, they spoke to whom? They so spoke when they came back to, to, to Moshe Rabbeinu. But they saw previously. Uh, they, the, the, right. They, they, when they say when they spoke, that means they had a, a preconceived of idea. Preconci- ah, pre- speech, prepared speech. Kind of. It's that ah. like, in, in that sense in speech, that they had, they'd written the script, mm-hmm. so to speak, mm-hmm. and they, they filmed the script that was in their heads. They, they saw what they wanted to see. Also, a short question. Sure. Perhaps you will answer it later, but uh, we also studied in North America that uh, perhaps one of the reasons for them to say Lashon Arab was because they feared for their future lives, especially in Eretz Israel. So that means that Lashon Arab sometimes is connected, or a lot of times connected with the idea of fear. We fear, that's why we try to overturn the things in our mouth. I think that's true. I, I, think that, I think that's true. I mean, I'm not sure it's true in all cases, but maybe we come back to that. Okay, sure. Okay. That's a good point. It struck me, and this is just a, a thought of, I had of my own, I don't have a source for this, that the month of Tammuz, as we know, each of the months are connected to one of the tribes, and each of the months is connected to the sign of the zodiac. The sign of the zodiac, which is connected to the month of Tammuz, is Cancer, the crab. Now, the crab have very interesting eyes. Crabs have compound eyes, which, ex- which consist actually of several thousand optical units. Reality is fragmented, from our point of view. So, so to speak, the crab perceives on its level reality, 
sight through thousands of different channels, thousands of individual pictures. You can see it a thousand different ways. The crab, and also the crab's eyes are on stalks, and they can be lowered back into the, into the sockets of the carapace, of the skull. In other words, the crab has this ability to retract its power of sight, to move itself, so to, so to speak, into a projection room, to take the power of sight and rather making it a, a, an, an organ of reception, it makes it into an organ, organ of projection. In the darkness of the skull of the crab, it's possible to project on its brain whatever it wants. And I was just thinking maybe this is a marshal for what the spies did. They retracted their eyes into their heads, the month of Tammuz, the crab, and in the darkness of their heads, right, they turned off the lights and then they, they fired up the projector. And they projected their script into the blackness of their skulls, of their imaginations. Um, I'd like to maybe move on to one other idea. Yeah. Let's move on. The Mitzvah of Tzitzis and um, the Mitzvah of Tzitzis is a Mitzvah of Ria, Ria seeing, or Isam Oisoi. So clearly, as the power of sight was damaged by what the spies did. That instead of using their eyes to record, they used their eyes, so to speak, as we're trying to suggest, to project. The Mitzvah of Tzitzis clearly comes as a tikkun for that mistake, I would suggest. <clears throat> Let's think a little bit about the Mitzvah of Tzitzis. If you look up into the sky on a beautiful summer day and you look into the farthest distance that there is, unimpeded by any kind of cloud, haze or mist, what is the color that you see? The color of blue. But that blue has a specific name. It's called Tcheles. <clears throat> Tcheles, Tchelet. The Gemara says that the, as we know, the original Mitzvah of Tzitzis was supposed to be with one of the strands should be blue. That blue is called Tchelet. Nowadays we've lost the uh, certain identity of the Chilazon, which is some kind of uh, shellfish some crustacean from which this blue, special blue color dye was uh, taken from. We don't know exactly what it is. There are some people who say that they've established uh, to their own satisfaction some, what that is. But most, I, know, most, I would say most, yeah. Most, probably most uh, of observant Jews wear tzitzis without this tchelis. I, I mean, if you wear it, it's certainly not a, a problem. But... We don't do it anymore. But the original mitzvah, for sure, one of the strands had to be blue. And the rest are white. Blue is the end of sight. As we said, if you look as far as the eye can see, the color you see is techeles. Techeles represents the end of sight, and white represents the beginning of sight. If you take the three primary colors, and you spin them, the color you get is white. It's the beginning of all color. White is the beginning of everything, and blue is the end of everything. From white to blue. Why not black? Black is supposed to be the most likeness. It could be that maybe that, okay, I don't want to go into this now, but maybe okay, black is the absence of color. Okay. Maybe it's the absence of light. Good point. Good point. I don't know. I mean, we could talk about that. That's actually, 
It says, there's a posseg that says that Hashem, uh, what's he called? It says the um, Osei Choshech. It could be that black is a creation by itself, but okay. But for the sake of what we're saying now, there's a Gemara that says the color of the Tcheles. Sorry? Bore Choshech, right? It says that. Uh, or, it's, a, it's a posseg which says um, about. Uh, uh, I've got, it's, it's gone now. I, I, in the Siddha, no, but this, I'm thinking about, there's, there's a Posik. This, the, it'll come back. Anyway, for, 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 um, <coughs> excuse me. So we're talking about <coughs> the beginning of sight and the end of sight. White is the beginning of sight. Techeles is the end of sight. Now, Techeles, if you were to write it in a slightly different way, you could also write as Tachlis. Tachlis means the end. It also means the purpose. Tachlis, techeles. The Gemara says in Brachus that the color of the techeles, the techeles is doma liyam, is similar to the sea. And the yam is doma la rakia. The, the, the sea is similar to the heavens the blue of the heavens, as we've been talking about. And the blue of the heavens is Doma le Kisei HaKavod. Now, the Kisei HaKavod, I'll translate it literally, but of course, all these translations into literal English don't really help us very much. The Kisei HaKavod literally is translated as the throne of glory. This is a mystical concept, which we're not going to be able to understand. But in the mystical understanding of it, there is a quote-unquote throne upon which, quote-unquote, Hashem sits, and the color of that kisei is the color of tcheles. The limitation of the spies, that they put their mouths in front of their eyes, limited what the eye is supposed to do. The eye is supposed to see beyond. The tzitzis is a four-cornered garment. Why is it four corners? Because the world, conceptually, is a four-cornered world. True, the world we understand is spherical. But we still speak about north, south, east, and west. The world conceptually is four. So, so to speak, this world of four corners, colloquially in English, we still talk about the four corners of the world. The world, the four directions, the four cardinal points of the compass are this world that defines the world. And we have something, we have a mitzvah, which takes something and it's supposed to take us out of this world, strings which are attached to this four-cornered garment to lead us beyond. The word tzitzis is connected to the word lahatzitz, which means to peak. Tzitzis are supposed to give you a peak beyond, a little glimpse of what's beyond. The blue of the tcheles, the blue of the tzitzis, that blue strand, is similar to the sea. The sea is something, says in Tehillim, Samti Gvul Liyam. Hashem says, I've placed a, a border, a limitation on the sea. The sea left to itself would swamp the earth many, many times, but Hashem has placed a border on it. The sea represents something which is basically without end. Without end. But as the Pasuk says, Hashem has limited it. Mitzrayim is Meitza Yam. That's another subject. But the Yam, which is Gematria 50, which of course is that which is beyond this world, seven times seven, seven, the Maharal speaks in many places, the seven days of the week, seven days of the diatonic scale, seven colors of the rainbow, seven, seven, seven. If you take something and you want to extrapolate it to its maximum degree, you times it by itself. Seven times seven is 49. That's the days of the Omer. We don't count the 50th day because the 50th, 50 is a number you can't count. Of course, there's a number called 50 you can count. But what 50 represents is beyond. It's to take you beyond. Yam, the sea, the color of the sea is the Tcheles. Chazal say that every single wave, so to speak, is the expression of the desire of the sea to once more try and swamp the world. But Hashem holds it back. Samti Gvul 
So the blue of the tzitzis, which lead out from this core four kind of garment, conceptually the world, is a reflection of the yam, which is something which by nature is without end. And the sea, the blue of the sea, is dome, is similar to the blue of the rakia, the tchelis of the sky, which we spoke about in the beginning, is something which is the color of beyond, the color of heaven, the color of tchelis, tachlis, without end. And that color is the reflection of something which is truly without end, which is the Ein Sof. That is what the power of sight is supposed, is supposed to use it for. The mitzvah of the tzitzis, or isa moisoi, our power of sight is to take our little eyes, I spy with my little eye, and lift it up, lift it up and up and up, and see what our purpose in the world is. It's very easy on each one of us in our lives to go through our lives and film our own little sitcom, our own little, what do they call it in America, soap opera. A soap opera in which Shem's not doing what he ought to do, and I'm not getting the job that I should get, and I'm not living in the house that I should have, and I'm not getting the shiduchim that I should be offered, and I'm not getting the cover that I'm getting, and I should not, don't have the health that I should be having. You have to lift your eyes up above and see Hashem is writing the script. Only Hashem sees and speaks. We have to speak what it is that is there. We have to say Hashem is just. Whatever Hashem does is just. It's the mud stick to use our eyes and to raise our eyes up. Karish Baruch should help us to you know, sin of the spies, sin of Re'ir, as we've talked about a little bit, to use our eyes, the iron tov, the iron tov and the pear tov, to speak good. And by speaking good, we will see good. The two are connected. When a person trains himself to speak good, to let no ra come out of his mouth, automatically there's a symbiotic relationship that he will see good. After the actions is drawn the heart, when a person accustoms himself, trains himself to always speak good, to see the good in things, and I'm sure we all know people who, who do this. I, I can think of somebody I'm thinking about now, and you, you know him and he's in the yeshiva. I'm not certainly going to t- say his name. But he's somebody that when you speak to him, he always has something good. He will always see the good side of the story. And you see that this leads to an iron tov, to see things as good, and the other way around. When you see things as good, you'll, see, you'll, you'll speak good thoughts, good, good speech. Reuven and Shimon, Re'ia and Shmia, the two months of tragedy, the darkest time of the Jewish month. If we train ourselves in these times, starting with Parashas Bamidbar and coming into the months of Tammuz and, and, uh, and Av, the darkest times of the year, if we, each one of us on our own level, trains ourselves to only let positive things come out of our mouth and only see things which see the good, see the good. I often think in English, you know, we talk about uh, gratitude and ingratitude. But in Hebrew, the expression is hakaratatov, hakarasatov, and kafuitov. Hakaratatov means what? The recognition of good. And ingratitude is kafuitov, is the, literally kafu is to cover over the good. The good is there, but somebody who is in, ungrateful, he covers over that good. These are two jobs that we have. To makir the tov. The tov is there all the time. The tov is the constant. There's the tov, and to see the tov, and to speak the tov. To hak- makir the tov, to recognize it. And to not to cover it over. Because for sure, if a person doesn't cover it over, he uncovers it, he will see very clearly in front of him. Again, I say, you know, this is 
work, work to be done, things to carry in our minds. And Kodesh Baruch Hu should help that in the schus of our ayin tov and our loshen tova, loshen tov, good speech, good thoughts, good sight, that this year, Mietz Hashem, the fasts of Tisha B'av, the fast of Shiva Asafatamas, will be turned into days of Yom Tov, as Chazal predict for us speedily in our days.